Hallelujah. 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 The only lesson for today's, <coughs> excuse me, blessed day service was taken from the first letter of Paul to the people of Corinth, um, reading from chapter 1, verse 1 to 16. The whole reading <coughs> was uh, Paul speaking to the church in Corinth, and more importantly, all believers, people who called upon the name of the Lord all over the world, praising God for their existence, first of all, and then letting them know that there should be no division amongst the body of Christ. Christ should be the focus. The love of God, the love of your neighbor, is more important than the process and the program that is Christianity. And that was what he was driving at. Yeah, not of Paul, of Apollos, of Cephas, of, of, of Christ. I am from this. That, that, wasn't, that wasn't what Christ wanted in us. And that wasn't what Paul wanted in us. And his main directive there was to be one. To be one. Because our adversary, the devil, his joy is in our division. His joy is in the division of the body of Christ. <coughs> Because what did Christ say when he cast out the demon and they said he was done by Christ, who was a demon also? He said, if a house that goes against itself cannot do what? <coughs> cannot stand. And that is the same thing Paul is warning us of here. That if there's division in the midst of the children of Christ, none of us can stand. May the love of Christ continue to keep us as one. Amen. What I wanted to focus on tonight, though, was... What Paul said from verse 4 to, to verse 9. If anyone finds that from I first thank Corinthians. My God always. He said, I thank my God always. On your behalf. On your behalf, what? The grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. This is the first time he mentions it. I am thanking God on your behalf for what? For the grace. Given you. Given you. By Jesus Christ. By Jesus Christ, yes. That in everything. <coughs> that in everything. Yeah, I am enriched by him. Yes. Uh, in all utterance yes. and in all knowledge. In everything you are enriched by him. This grace has enriched you in utterance, in knowledge, in what you speak and in what you understand. In the things you speak out of your mouth, the things that come out of you. And knowledge is the one that comes into you. So from within and without, for the things that come into you are the things that go out. The grace of God has sanctioned it. The grace of God has seasoned it. Yes. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Even as the testimony of Christ. So when Christ is the one generating what is coming out of you and what is going into you, then surely his stamp and his testimony must of all surety be in you. Yes. So that ye come behind in no gift. And this is the reason why that grace was bestowed upon us. So that you will do what? You will not come behind in any gift. You will not be lacking of any gift. Yes. Waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Any gift while you do what? Wait for the coming. While you wait for the end. And what was the next verse after that? Who shall also confirm you unto the end. The person you're waiting for, the one who is seasoning what is going in and out of you, is also the judge who will confirm you at the end. Yes. That ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. So that you may be blameless at the end of time. So that you may be blameless at the end of your time. Essentially, all Paul said here was the Lord has planted a seed in you. The Lord has laid the foundation of righteousness in you. And he has done this so that you, don't have, you can't point a finger to him and say, God, but I didn't know. But God, I didn't understand. But God, I didn't have enough time. He has given you all the tools and all the equipment to be successful here on earth. So that at the end of time, you may be what? You may be blameless. So my question to you today is very simple. What has the grace of God purchased in you? What exactly has that grace purchased in you today? If anyone finds the book of Matthew chapter 11 very quickly. Matthew eleven twenty three, 23. And also Luke 10, 13. Essentially saying the same thing. But yes. And all the people were amazed. And all the people were amazed. And said. And said. Is this the son of 
David? Is this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, yes. they said, Which one are you reading now? Uh, 11, 23. 23, yes. Matthew 11, 23. Yes. Uh, but when and, the Pharisees, though, and though Capernaum. Thank you, that's it. And though Capernaum, yes. Which art exalted unto heaven. He said, Capernaum, you that are exalted up to heaven, yes. I be brought down to hell. You will be brought down to hell. Why? If the mighty works which have been done in thee. Listen to this. If the mighty works that had been done in thee. Had been done in Sodom. Had been done in Sodom. It will have remained unto this day. It will have remained unto this day. But I say unto you. Yes. That it shall be more tolerable for the law. For the land of Sodom. He said it would be more tolerable for the land of Sodom that was burnt in sulfur. Yes. In the day of judgment. Yes. Than for thee. Than for thee. Thank you. God bless you. Thank Luke you, sir. Nine, Luke 9. 13. Luke 10, 13. Oh, 10, 13. It's essentially the same thing. And he's speaking to a, a different town at this point. Woe unto thee. Woe unto thee. Chorazin. 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 Woe unto thee. Yes. Bethsaida. Bethsaida, yes. For it. For if the mighty works have been done in Tyre and Sidon. For, for if this mighty works have been done in Tyre and Sidon, yes. Which have been done in you. Yes. They had a great while ago repented. They would have repented. Thank you. God bless you. What am I talking about here? It said the Lord God Almighty, His grace is what is going to inspire what comes out of us and the knowledge we have. Now if the grace of the knowledge of Christ has brought you to the point of seeing miracles, of seeing His mighty deeds, and yet you cannot trust him. Then it is warning us here that at the end of time, it will be better for those in Sodom and those in Gomorrah. It is an incredible thing to see the hand of God, to see the miracle of God, yet still continue to not believe in his powers, to not believe in his capability to deliver you, to save you, to do new things in your life. The grace of God has granted us the knowledge of mighty things. Yes. So why don't we trust? So why are we still lacking in trust? If you have seen his miracles, he has a greater expectation from you. He warned these people, you've seen my greatness. You've seen my judgment. You've heard of it. Yet, you have not turned your hearts onto me. Yet, you have not completely given your trust over unto me. Why? Why? Why do we still continue to let fear cripple us? Why do we still continue to let distrust cripple us? The grace of God has revealed to us over and over again His powers. Even in this very church. We have seen those who the world called barren, bare children, before our own eyes here. We have seen those that the world had cast away be raised up again in glory, even in our midst here. We have seen those that the world had called dead breathe with life again in this same church here. The grace of God it is what has, is what that has manifested these things to us. Yeah, what do we do with that information? We fear when trouble comes knocking. We scratch our heads when we feel like sorrow is at the door. We begin to have our hearts pound when the pressure comes on. The God you serve is a covenant fulfilling God. And if he has spoken it, if he has shown it to you in the past, it will do it again in our lives. This is the God we are serving. His grace has shown us this. His expectation for us is that we ride, we ride it out. We stand firmly with him in trust, in hope, in faith, in belief unto the end. Because he who has done it once, who has shown it to us once, will do it again. And it's not just in faith. Even in our nature of sin. His blood has bought us the grace of forgiveness. What have we done with that? We continue to go back into sin. Everyone knows the line from Hebrews 10, um, I think it's 26. If we continue to sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of truth, Nothing is left but what? The fearful expectation of judgment. For if we sin willfully, yes. after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, yes. there remaineth no more yes. sacrifice for sin. There is no more sacrifice. For sin. 
There's no more grace at that point. Because his blood has bought us the original grace. The grace of God has redeemed us. So why do we begin to stain our clothes again? This is the same God that said, I did not spare the angels who were in heaven. So what hope do we have if we continue in sin? If grace has brought you to righteousness, and grace has brought you to glory, why do we continue to trample ourselves in mud? Sin is a disease, and we are always fighting it. And we'll probably fight it till the day we die. But it is a battle that we must win. And we must win on a daily basis. Because as he told us in the lesson again, His grace, His grace, His grace has bought us the opportunity for salvation. And we are the ones who can only lose it with our hands. He has given it to us already. He said, I'm thankful to God for, for the grace he has given you through who? Through Christ Jesus. That was the monumental reason why he came here to die for us. He has given us that grace. And the question now is, what are we doing with it? Let the grace of God lead you to righteousness. Every time you want to step to sin, let the grace, let the fear of God drive you away from it. There is nothing more dreadful here in this world. To have the grace of God, to have the love of God, to know the voice of God. And yet, let that same voice now cast you into eternal damnation. And finally, His grace has brought us deliverance. So there is no more need to fear. It says we are no longer slaves to fear. We're no longer slaves to fear. But we have a spirit now that cries, Abba, Father. There is nothing that should bring us to our knees anymore. Because we are of the ones that speak the name of Christ. All I'm asking us here to do is become new individuals. Become new creatures in Him. <clears throat> Claim that grace that has been planted in you. Claim that grace in the face of your tribulations. Claim that grace in the face of your emptiness. Claim that grace in the face of temptation. Claim that grace and let it help you overcome. Because you are more powerful than you can imagine. Why? Because Christ is in us. Let's tap into that power. I'm telling you, it is a marvelous thing. To trust God. It is a marvelous thing to trust the power of God. It is a marvelous thing to see all the noise around you. And still be able to be calm. I know that the God you serve is a God who never fails. But you have to own the skill. It is a skill. It is a habit. It is something that we have to forge ourselves. Every time you hear hey, hey, hey. Doesn't mean you have to jump. There is no fear for the children of Christ. As long as you know your heart is walking in righteousness, then you have nothing to fear. Because God has made his promise to you that no weapon fashioned against you shall what? Shall prosper. So trust that and hold on to that as long as you are living in righteousness. This is the grace that has been bestowed upon us for being the righteous children of Christ. The whole book of, uh, 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 of John, the first John, second John, the uh, third John, and that's all he says, their children, their children. We are his children, the children of Christ. And all those promises he made in there are to us. That is the grace we have bought. That is the grace you're coming to church regularly has bought. That is the grace you're meditating on Christ regularly has bought. That is the grace that you're living in him and loving him as has bought for you. So don't let that grace go to waste. Do not let the grace of Christ in you go to waste. It is one that has been planted in you for eternal salvation in heaven and also here on earth. Nothing can overcome you. I assure you today, as long as you're living in God, nothing, I repeat it again, nothing can overcome you. 
as long as you're living in Christ. So trust that. No matter how close to the hour is, trust it that nothing will overcome or overwhelm you as long as you're doing it right and your heart is clear before God. The Spirit of God has spoken into your heart. The Spirit of God has planted the seed into your heart. That grace is there. The foundation is there. It is up to us to nurture it and let it build a mountain, a mountain that will lead us to our eternal salvation. May the Lord God of hosts bless His holy words. Amen.